Welcome, everybody, to our lesson six of the Orthodox Ecclesiology course. We're very glad to have you. Thanks be to God. I hope you had a good first week of the uh, first week of Great Lent, where we enter in with uh, increased zeal and fasting and prayer uh, for the with the Great Canon and Divine Liturgy of the Presanctified Gifts. And now we're just off of uh, just finished our celebration of the Sunday of Orthodoxy, which is very timely for our topic. And of course, we're coming up on the Sunday of the commemoration of St. Gregory Palamas. So it's very appropriate for us tonight to deal with uh, the second and third pillar of Orthodoxy. We, we talked about St. Photius the Great last week. And I really encourage you all to, if you haven't seen that, go back and look at that. Uh, it is uh, uh, a very important time period for church history and for our understanding of the church in relation to uh, the papal and reformed Protestant confessions of the West. Very important for us to understand those uh, those events surrounding the Eighth Ecumenical Council. Now we're going to be looking at the post schism time period, and of course we can only cover so much. We've had to narrow it down. We wanted to look at a variety of things uh, a little more broadly, but we're, we're going to be focused on that which is really relevant to our day. So we can protect ourselves from the various delusions and heresies and, uh, and confusion of our day, which is unprecedented, really, in the church history. So we're going to be looking at the, one of the most important, if not the most important theologian of, of the second millennium, and that is St. Gregory Palamas. He has left his mark, but not because he was original, but because he was not original, because he was following the Holy Fathers, and he was one of the great uh, experiential theologians who would then explain the experience of the saints in a way that protected the church from delusion and heresy, and he fought the various heretically-minded clerics of his day. St. Gregory Palamas, we'll look at a little bit, a very important uh, teacher of his the same time period, uh, just after St. Gregory Palamas, about, this, about the same time period, one of the uh, uh, defenders and, and promoters of the patristic tradition of the St. Nicholas Cavasilas, and then we'll look at St. Mark of Ephesus, the Atlas of Orthodoxy, and his encyclical uh, toward the end of his life to the Orthodox everywhere, which of course is sent to us as well. So let's start, let's say, with our, say our prayers, and then we'll have a little introduction about St. Gregory Palamas. We'll, uh, as usual, pray the prayer before the gospel, and then chant the preparion of the uh, Feast of Pentecost. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Illumine our hearts, O Master, who lovest mankind with the pure light of the divine knowledge. Open the eyes of our minds to the understanding of thy gospel teachings. To bless also fear of thy blessed commandments. And trample down all kind of desires, we may enter a spiritual manner of living, both thinking and doing such things as are well pleasing unto thee. For thou art the illumination of our souls and bodies of Christ our God, and of the image and of glory. The fathers of without beginning is all holy good and life creating spirit, both now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. <laughs> Tu salis anadixas, cata pensas aftis to pnema to aion, que vi afton, tinicumenis aginensas, filantro pedoxas. Amen. May we have the blessings and the enlightenment from God through the prayers of our Holy Father, St. Gregory Palamas, and St. Nicholas, and St. Mark of Ephesus. So this is Orthodox Ecclesiology, Lesson 6, and we're looking at the teachings surrounding the church and the time, uh, the, 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 fa the issues facing the saints at the time, and uh, also how we can apply that today because we have some of the same ideas, same delusions that are circulating today as in the time of the great saints. St. So Gregory Palamas will be the first we'll look at. And let's uh, bring that up. Shrink me down. 
And let's put St. Gregory there and look, look a bit at his life before we begin his teachings. So if a lot of us might, maybe not have not, not read his life, not, not familiar with it, very, very briefly. Uh, St. Gregory was born at the end of the 13th century, 1296. He was in Constantinople in a family that was close to the emperor at the time. He is... Uh, uh, his contribution, I should say, at the outset, is crucial for our understanding of and navigating through modernity and the various issues that we're facing. He was, I would say, at the mountain of at the at the base of the mountain that would be modernity. He was at the at the outset, so to speak, and he was facing the issues that would then explode in practice on on the social level over time uh, at at at, at the root. At the root, which is a question of Trinitarian theology, who is God and our relationship with God. And it is not an accident, and it was very, very, very much foreseen in the theologians, the Orthodox teachers of the day, that the stance of Barlam, which was the uh, the one who was challenging the church and the church's teaching, and St. Gregory Palamas and others with him, would lead to atheism. They would, they, their theology meant that we could not have an experience of God in this life. And of course, that would mean that people would no longer have an experiential, personal encounter, uh, would not even consider it possible. And what, what would be the result? It would be atheism. And of course, that's exactly what happened in the West. Disintegration was uh, apparent as a seed in the time of St. Gregory. So, he was given an exceptional education by the emperor, who personally took him on and helped him, uh, Emperor Andronikos II, the Paleologos. Uh, his teacher uh, at the time explained, exclaimed toward the end of his education, when he was only about 17, he left for the mon monastery to, just before 19 or 20, rather, at year, 19 years of age. So at the time of, of 17, 18 years old, he gave... Uh, explanations of the philosophy of Aristotle and his teacher explained that it was as if he had the the great teacher in front of him and, and he, he wasn't speaking to him himself Aristotle was speaking himself to to them at the day so that was how much uh, how impressed people were with the young man's knowledge and he, he, he had a great future in the world before him but he departed for Mount Athos he went to Vatopedi and along with uh, his brothers and eventually his whole family, including his blessed mother and his sister, who were quite grace-filled. When you read the life, you can see uh, that the whole family was filled with the grace of God. And he came under the elder Nicodemus and Fatopedi. And because of raids, not long after that, a few years after that, he had to leave the Holy Mountain for Thessaloniki, where he was ordained a priest. And he went to Veria, which is about an hour, well, would have been longer by foot then, a uh, few hours from Thessaloniki. Uh, and he was in the in the uh, mountainous uh, area outside Veria, in, which you can visit today. I've been there to his cave where he lived. And he uh, lived there with a few brothers and eventually, eventually brought his sisters and mother with him. And his mother reposed there in Veria. In 1330, not long after that, <clears throat> when uh, St. Gregory had had time both on Athos and in Veria to already begin his writing. He had, well, there's so much to say in his life. He had visions of the St. John the Theologian, or the Mother of God, who uh, angels came and others to encourage him to write. And he began writing. First thing he wrote was on the feast of the entrance of the Mother of God in the temple. And to, to support that and justify that, uh, some had doubted that if that wasn't a legitimate feast at all. And so St. Gregory began, uh, and it's very apparent in all of his writings, his very closeness and love for the, the, the Theotokos, the, the birth giver of God. And he uh, then encountered this intellectual, this scholastic-minded man from Italy, a Greek from southern Italy, who had been accepted in the court uh, in, in, in Constantinople, uh, for his uh, knowledge of the sciences, but then became also, because he was very ambitious, uh, took interest in theology and and encountered the uh, writings and the teachings of the fathers on Athos uh, about the Jesus prayer 
and other things. And he began to write against uh, the Orthodox way of spiritual life. And Gregory responds. Uh, the first major thing that he writes is on the procession of the Holy Spirit, the treaties, the two-part treaties of the, on the procession of the Holy Spirit, which, thanks be to God, we are finally very close to finalizing, perfecting, and publishing. Uh, one of uh, it's taken years. I don't, I don't remember when we started any. It's been at least six years, maybe. I, it's, I've lost track. And so we finally are getting to the point where we can, we're, we're looking at the, at the light at the end of the tunnel. And to produce uh, to, in English the first ever uh, translation of this work by St. Gregory Palamas. And I'll be sharing excerpts from that translation with you tonight. We'll be focusing on what he has to say in terms of the ecclesiology and in terms of the, the papal uh, uh, confession uh, in the West. And so he responds, it's very important to understand this, he responds first with an analysis of the procession of the Holy Spirit, because that's what Barlam, Barlam had, had been giving a defense of orthodoxy, but the defense of orthodoxy was very strange. He said, well, the whole thing is ridiculous. We can't know God anyway. <laughs> well, that was quite not the defense of orthodoxy. And so Saint, uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing and very quickly re repeating the, the debate here, but essentially that's what it came across as. And Saint Gregory, of course, responded and said, well, no, that's not, that's not the case at all. And then they began this back and forth. Actually, he actually spent time trying to convince Barlam in Thessaloniki of his error, and he was not interested. Uh, he left again for Constantinople and started a war against St. Gregory. And he writes then the triads, the famous triads, which are three parts, the nine, essentially nine treaties, nine part treaties, three parts times three. And in the 19, in the I should say the 1330s and 1340s, early 40s, and they are his writings are affirmed by the Holy Community on Mount Athos with a famous famous Hagiarite tome, and so the fathers on Athos come to the support of their dearest and most beloved uh, theologian of the day, young but uh, charismatic. He had been asked to be the abbot of Esigmeno Monastery. He he, he was. The fathers there could not come to, uh, after the pose of the previous abbot, could not come to a, an agreement. And so they appealed to the fathers in Cadiz at the Holy Community. And they said, well, you should take St. Gregory. And Greg, St. Gregory served as the abbot there, but not very long because they were not interested in his strict monastic life that he was bringing into the, mona the monastery. And so he departed again with a small brotherhood. And... Uh, now, Barlam responds and writes against St. Gregory uh, by name. He had been doing it without naming him. Now he goes by name, and he, and he says that any claim of real or conscious experience of God is the heresy of Messalianism or Bogo, Bogolism, Bogomolism. And so this is the uh, somewhat something like Pentecostalism today, uh, in that day. Uh, and so, obviously... Barlam has no, no experience and no understanding of the Orthodox way of life, the Orthodox teaching. St. Gregory refutes Barlam by way of exposing the underlying source of his errors, which are common with, unfortunately, the scholastics in many, many ways, the Hellenic philosophy. He had exalted it. He had uh, declared it must be had if you're going to have wisdom in this world. And so he was entirely uh, within the rationalistic perspective on the spiritual life and not understanding uh, the the epignosis, the divine uh, revelation of those who have experienced, firsthand experience of God's grace, God's person. Uh, other adversor adversaries that came after Balaam, Balaam eventually left for the West, became a cardinal or a bishop in the uh, papal confession. And uh, uh, then we had as successors, St. Gregory uh, the um, uh, adversaries of St. Gregory were Gregory Akindinos and Nikiforos Gregoras. These were the humanists who had essentially uh, embraced what Barlam had been teaching because they, they themselves had as a common background, a common base, uh, the uh, Greek philosophy, and it, which had been uh, exalted by a, a, a minority group of intellectuals in Constantinople who had been slowly uh, in that century, uh, becoming interested in Western uh, writers like Thomas Aquinas. And so you had that 
infiltrating in the uh, Orthodox capital there, the ortho, the, the capital of, of the Roman Empire. And there were councils held, a number of councils held between 341 and, 350, and 350, 1351, rather, and 1341 and 1351, about a 10 year period, there were a number of councils held, all justifying and vindicating St. Gregory and the Hesychast and, and condemning the teaching of Barlam and Kindinos and Gregoras. And uh, so that's in summary, very quickly, there's so much in his life. Uh, for those of you on uh, uh, Patreon, we sent out a lecture that I had done in Australia uh, two years ago now, just about this time, two years ago, a lecture that I gave in Australia on St. Gregory Palamas and his life and teaching. So if you're interested more in the life of St. Gregory, you can uh, uh, go to our Orthodox Ethos uh, channel uh, and find that lecture, St. Gregory Palamas, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the West and Catholicism, a guide of orthodoxy. Uh, he was glorified, St. Gregory was glorified only nine years after his repose, nine years, very uh, very quick in the Orthodox Church for anyone to be glorified. So let's look at, 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 at his, at his uh, excerpts from his Treatise on the Holy Spirit, the Procession of the Holy Spirit. It's the first time you these text, this text has appeared in English in, uh, to my knowledge, ever. Maybe there have been other excerpts translated here and there, but this is uh, the first time that large portions are going to be shared. So this is kind of exciting. I'm very excited and happy to be able to do this. Uh, so let's look at some excerpts from this. This is the first trees, and we're also going to look at an excerpt from the second trees. The beginning here, he's opening it up. He's discussing the question here. And I want you to enter in here to understand how he sees uh, the heresy that is the filioque and the, 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 the promoters of that heresy, which unfortunately are the followers of the Pope, the Latins, uh, or, or the, the, uh, uh, Papal Protestant confession. And so let's read and we'll comment afterwards. So St. Gregory says at the very beginning of his treatise, the subtle serpent and source of vice once again rears his own head against us. He whispers things out opposite to the truth. Further seeing he has in further seeing he has indeed had his head crushed by the cross of Christ. He makes those who obey his destructive counsels in every generation each take the place of his own head. And so, like a hydra, he has sprouted many heads instead of the one. He relentlessly speaks utter unrighteousness through them. So he did with the Arians, so with the Apollinarians, so with the Eunomians and Macedonians. These are fourth, fourth century. Heresies, they were all defeated by the great three hierarchs and the saints at the time. And he has thus attached to himself, to his coiled body, the host of others who have clung to him. The wicked one always feeding off of serpentine and earthly wickedness. The vigilant stalker tirelessly looking out for the heel. He's referring to Genesis where the Lord prophesies the heel will be bruised uh, by the serpent, uh, the heel of, of the master. Uh, that is the crucifixion, but we, we can't get into an exegesis of that right now. Tyrus is looking out for the heel, that is to say deceit, the sophist most resourceful and immensely ingenious in every opinion noxious to God, not having at all forgotten his own evil art, introduces innovative expressions concerning God through the Latins, which hearken to him. While these innovations seem to make but a small change, yet they create the occasion for many evils and bring in many things that are subtle, foreign to piety, and logically absurd. He thus clearly displayed to all in doing this that even the smallest thing is not small in matters concerning God. So here the saint is placing the great uh, heresy of his day, uh, which numerically was massive, akin to the Ar Arians in the fourth century. Uh, but he's placing it in the sense of the way that the enemy of our salvation has taken those who are uh, susceptible to his machinations and, pr and produced 
uh, these opinions uh, which are noxious to God, these the sophistry uh, which are foreign to pieties and logically absurd. And much of his treatise is actually also utilizing Aristotle and Aristotelian logic to, def to defeat the absurdities of the filioque. But it's very interesting, the expression in Greek, which we translated here as through the Latins which hearken to him, uh, in the, fr the phrase in, in Greek reminds one of, uh, of, of, of essentially mindless organs. Uh, there's an expression in Greek which actually is very sim similar to the, what he used in, in, his, in the Greek of his day. And so it's a very powerful thing in Greek. It doesn't come quite across in, in English, unfortunately. But it's very powerful to see that they, they have been used and, and, and led by the enemy. So this is something that's fairly unknown among many Orthodox, including Orthodox theologians. I remember I had a discussion with a prominent Orthodox theologian, teaches at a seminary in the East Coast, uh, and 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 I and he was he was adamant that Saint Gregory Palmas was was a was a an admirer uh, and, and and sat at the foot, so to speak, uh, of Aquinas. And of course, only tremendous ignorance of Saint Gregory's teachings and the events of the day could lead one to, to believe such a thing. And this is indicative of our day. We have people who are presenting orthodoxy, teaching orthodoxy in our seminaries and online, and yet they have not even looked at the great defenders of the faith and their teachings. Uh, and so now, they, now, God willing, soon we'll, they'll be able to do that. They'll be able to see that St. Gregory taught very dynamically and powerfully and, and, and conclusively and decisively that the heresy of papal Protestantism uh, is akin to the ancient heresies uh, and is, uh, like them, a tool in the hand of the enemy of our salvation. Very powerful. We'll see. He, gets, he says much more. So let's not be, get bogged down here. Let's go on to the next slide. Uh, until, before I begin looking at the next slide, it, it's important for all of those who are watching, who might be inquirers, catechumens, interested in Orthodox, you might be uh, Roman Catholics, and, and pious, piously looking into the ancient church, the Orthodox, the One Holy Catholic, and some church, to say that when we talk about the ism that is Catholicism, the, the heresy that is has been taught and unfortunately been preached and fallen into by uh, the popes from the first millennium on, second millennium on, obviously we are not uh, speaking of any one person or any any of anyone who's seeking the, the faith and the truth among uh, the Roman Catholics. This is not a personal thing. We're not attacking people. This is a question of the truth. It's a question of uh, a theology. And so when we talk about papal Protestantism, this is a phrase we use uh, because we believe it best represents what happened and what, what was wrong in the West and that we reorient ourselves to understand properly with relation to the ancient church, what happened? Because usually for the vast majority of people who look at these questions, they're looking at it either from the Roman Catholic slash papal Protestant perspective or the Protestant or reformed Protestant uh, perspective. And, they're, and they're, they're, they're only in that paradigm or that, in that context. And so they, the, the hope is that by using these phrases, people will be jarred out of that that uh, paradigm, which is a, which is a dead end, and they'll see things in the broader perspective within the historical context, and they realize that Protestantism, Protestantism is the logical outcome of papalism, papal Protestantism. In other words, they, the Pope set the stage for Protestantism. He and his stance of not listening to the Holy Fathers, not listening to the to the consensus, not listening to the uh, uh, the the council, the Church and Council. That's why we looked at the Eighth Ecumenical Council. So important. Doesn't listen to the church. It says, seems good to us, to the Holy Spirit, and to us. That's when the church speaks authoritatively. So that is a form of Protestantism. He protests against the church and walks away, starts a new church. Uh, and then they follow after him 500 years later after, uh, well, much turmoil through that whole period of trying to regain the conciliarity uh, of the church. We'll talk about that later with St. Mark of Ephesus tragic period 
of church history. So I, hopefully that will help understand why we use that terminology. It's not, a, it's not a, of course, wanting to insult anyone, God forbid, but we're trying to get at the, at the core, at the bones, as it were, of the truth here so that people can understand uh, better the truth of things. So let's go on to the second excerpt here, so again from his introduction. And he continues, but he says, addressing the Latins, why do you say there are two origins for the divinity? For what does it matter if you do not plainly say this, but if it is deduced from what you are saying? Such things are the depths of Satan, the mysteries of the evil one, which he whispers to those who lend their ears to him. He whispers not in the sense of softening or lowering the tone of his voice, but rather in concealing the intended harm. For my part, I believe this is how he also whispered to Eve. But since we have been taught by the divine wisdom of the fathers that we should not be ignorant of his devices, which were at first on the whole invisible to the many, we would never at any time receive you into communion as long as you say that the Spirit is also from the Son. Very, very powerful words here from St. Gregory. Uh, this is not a heresy pertaining to the Holy Trinity. Is nothing less than from the depths of Satan, the mysteries of the evil one, in which people are lending their ears, ears to them. So they've lost the uh, orthodox discernment, the science of the spiritual life, to spot the enemy's machinations, to resist his uh, his inferences, his suggestions. Uh, and this, we touched on this in the previous lecture just a bit, but really behind the schism, why is the schism really not just a process that happened after 1054 and nobody really knows where it, when it ended? Why is that not the case? Why is this an error? Because spiritually speaking, when one comes and teaches and preaches and accepts heresy and embraces it, and rejects the conciliar decisions of the church, they've arrived at a point of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of becoming deaf to the Spirit of God. They've arrived at the point of, of being organs of the enemy, not understanding that they, they're falling after the enemy of salvation. In other words, they've, they've already arrived at a, 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 at a distance. They've, they've been, they're in apostasy. That's what apostasy means, to become distanced, foreign, alien, far from the grace of God. And so uh, long before heresy is taught and preached, there's a falling away on the spiritual level from the way of Christ. The truth of Christ is lost because we've lost the way of Christ, the orthodox ethos, the orthodox way of being and living and, and struggling spiritually. Uh, that's, that's, the, that's, that's how an embrace of heresy and the teaching of heresy comes about. So it's very important to understand behind this is not simply a philosophical discussion. Today they want to relativize things. They want to say, oh, no, it was just being understanding. Really, they didn't mean this. And we've reached a point where we have understand one another on the filioque. Well, there would have to be, if that were the case, there would be a revolution in terms of understanding of the way of being as well, the way of Christ. If there was truly an embrace of the truth of Christ and the truth of the question of the Trinity, the, the, the confession of the Trinity here, as it pertains to the Philippi, there would there would be changes on the spiritual level as well. There would be tremendous repentance, as we all are in repentance. Every one of us inside, if you're on the path of Christ, whether coming to church or in the church, you're repenting continually. That's a stance that we have. So there would be that kind of uh, that kind of upheaval that we saw with the falling away. There would be an upheaval with the return. So this is just a misunderstanding of of the relation between the dogma and ethos or, 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 or the faith and the way, uh, the truth and the way. We do, we've lost uh, ourselves, some of us, to understand how these two are connected and how they're inseparable. Uh, so he says, we can never receive you into communion as long as you say this heretical teaching. It has to be repented of and rejected because otherwise the, the, there's no way for you to assimilate the orthodox way and the orthodox ethos. As long as you stay foreign to the truth, you'll never be able to assimilate. The spirit of truth will not dwell in you. So it's very, there's much going on here in this text. It's not 
there's a lot that's unstated. So if, if somebody reads this text with a Barlamite rationalist scholastic mindset, he's not going to get it. He's got to he's got to put that aside and enter into the way Saint Gregory is living and teaching uh, uh, the faith here. Now he goes on and he says uh, in one thirty three further on. Now the Latins, oh, the simultaneous senselessness and madness. They actually despise the reverent and confessed order in God. And those things which Basil the Great and Gregory the Theologian confessed to be beyond their own knowledge as being ineffable and transcending us, these things the Latins boast that they understand. But they innovate regarding the inexpressible and incomprehensible procession of the Holy Spirit. Or, to speak more bluntly, they blaspheme when they say that the procession is both indirect and direct, both proximate and far, by which they risk degrading the Holy Spirit into a creature, indeed. Uh, there's so much we could say here and go on, uh, but, and we will in future, God willing, we'll present the book, we'll have like uh, podcasts all about the book as we get closer to publication, and we'll try to flesh out some of the most important themes here. But you see here that uh, what reminds one of here are the Eunomians. The Eunomians also thought that they could peer into the essence of God, know the essence of God. And he says here, the Latins boast they can understand that which even Gregory the Theologian confesses is beyond his knowledge. The inexpressible, incomprehensible procession of the Holy Spirit. And they they opine that they understand what these things uh, are, are really all about. And of course, the fathers use these terms precisely to put up a boundary out of which we should not pass, not that they have peered into the essence of and the, the, the life of the Holy Trinity before all time, but by the experience and also following the Holy Fathers, but also the revelation, this is, this is the the already the boundaries that can be laid down for the proper understanding and within that one can work out their salvation so let's go on we've got a lot to cover uh since they the latins he says say the one is from the two this is what happens in the theology of the filioque right the the, the they're proceeding from the father and the son that's what the filioque means and the son it's a latin term and uh, since the one is from the two, Father and the Son, in the same respect in which the origin and the cause are also both thought and said, and these are the three hypostases, and so the three persons of the divinity, one in nature, they say the one is from two origins, and thus introduce two origins and two causes, and thus polytheism. For God is one not only because there is one nature, but also because one person possesses the anaphoral return of those which are from him. And those from the origin return to the one cause and one origin. Those from the origin being not only both of the two, but each one of them separately. So he's saying the oneness of God is not only in their nature, but also in their generation of the Son, procession of the Holy Spirit from the Godhead from the Father. And so that is a integral part of understanding of the oneness unity of God. And so when you introduce two origins, two causes, you've fallen away from the, the unity and the oneness of God, and you introduce polytheism. Of course, he's not saying this because they actually believe this, but this is the outcome, this is the consequence. Many times in theology, uh, the fathers will speak this way that the, the these these groups believe this now the group may or may not have ever said that but that's the result of their theology right and that's what will happen is that there will be a falling away from the orthodox doctrine in this direction if they persist in insisting on this teaching you know whatever the teaching might be he goes on so to fall away from what is right this is in treaties too by the way so we've gone now to Part This is a two-part, and it's from 2.2, uh, and it's very interesting how he speaks about the Latin Confession. I think this is, this is what we're, we're quoting this so we get a sense of his understanding of what has happened to uh, 
in what this is 350 years after or 300 years after the, the schism now right 300 years it's longer than america's been around 300 years uh and he's saying this is what this is what's uh what's befallen the lads and he likens it to an elephant the fall of an elephant listen to what he says so to fall away from what is right was something common to all the churches as evil laid way sometimes to the one sometimes to the to another through the length of time but that a fallen one no longer return this only occurred with the church of the latins so he has in mind the pentarchy i i, I suppose and the, the local churches that were founded by the apostles and he's saying that yes there was times when there was apostasy in constantinople and alexandria antioch even rome had apostate popes uh but they returned the, the the heresy was overcome and the local church was not lost it was not lost entirely even though there were swaths of, of people taken away through the heresy but he's saying that's not the case with the latins 300 years have passed and the entire western part of the uh, once part of the empire part of the the church has followed after the pope and and uh, been broken off from the communion of the rest of the church at the time uh the rest of the church so that a fallen one no longer returned this one only occurred with the church of the latins even though this is even though she is both the largest and chief and possessing the most eminent summit of the patriarchal thrones the same thing befell her who is the greatest of the churches that befell the elephant which is the greatest of the animals they say that it does not lay itself down on the ground for rest even during sleep but it rests a while by crouching for a little time on its sides and if it were to suffer something and fall down it is no longer able to get itself up again but for the elephants the cause is actually the weight of the body and the sheer enormity of their flesh which is cumbersome and weighs them down just like an overlying piece of lead weighing uh, piece of lead weighing many talents in contrast with the latins i gather that it is only pride i would almost say an incurable passion which according to the apostle is also most particularly the crime belonging to the only evil one which is the reason why that one is forever incurable so these are very very uh, powerful words here he's saying that he's likening the Latins, not only to an elephant which cannot get up, its enormity uh, is, is, is keeping it down. And of course, it's the, 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 the weight of the elephant and what keeps it down, right? But the, the, the weight of the, of, of the Latins is the, is the pride which keeps it down, the massive amount of pride that has entered into the papal throne and people have embraced as legitimate authority, apostolic authority. And there's no repentance, there's no humility, there's no return to communion. And he says this is what happens, of course, to the evil one. What happened is he looked upon his own greatness as belonging to himself, as him being the source of that greatness, the, the brightness of Lucifer, the, the brightest of all the angels. Instead of giving glory to the source and humbly re recognizing where it came from, he was enamored with himself his own light which was pure intellect and he fell from communion attributing all of it to himself so that pride becomes almost incurable as it were not entirely it's always possible if there's repentance but it, because it's such such a a, a damnable and, and 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 piercing and destructive passion it becomes as if incurable and so this is this is a very powerful we, we we sometimes quote saint eustine popovich talking about the three falls but this is almost even more uh powerful in terms of analysis and, and, and uh, polemic so let's look at the rest of this quote this is part b he goes on but should this tribe of the latins push him back they are able since indeed they are human immediately all we 
of the right mindset, gathered together into one, using, as it were, some sort of trunks, which nature also uh, has also provided as a help from the, for the elephants that are not, from the elephants that are not lying down for those that have fallen. So in other words, he's saying there's other elephants that come. By the way, you can see these sentences are massive, very complex text to translate. One of the reasons why it's taking forever. Uh, so, you know, rem remember that in, in your in, in showing mercy on us in our in our tardiness. Uh, but he's he says here that these different ele elephants can come with their trunks and help the other one to lift up. Uh, thus, having used the God-inspired oracle oracles, the Holy Father's teachings. We would raise them up and set them standing on their feet and unswervingly maintaining the rule of piety. So he, he says, we're ready. We're, we're, we're ready to come. Like those elephants coming and helping their fellow uh, animal to do the same for the Latins. They fall and they cannot get up because of their massive pride. But if they would allow us, we would come with the God-inspired oracles and we would raise them up and help them stand on their feet, and maintain the rule of piety. So the rule of piety is, what we were talking about earlier, is the basis which then, when lost, leads to heresy, right? So it's the, it's, it's the underlying spiritual reality that one has to remain in to not fall into delusion. Uh, goes on, yet those who willingly lay themselves down will not profit at all. Even if the remedy for pseudodoxy were to be prepared and administered by the celestial intellects themselves. It says, even if angels came and tried to remedy this pseudodoxy, this cacodoxy, false glory, literally false opinion, uh, even if the angels from heaven were to come, if they willingly persist in this, there's nothing. Anyone can do. God cannot even change their, their their path. For theirs is a saying that has been expressed by the prophetic words, we have healed Babylon, but she was not healed. So this is Jeremiah 51.9. So this is St. Gregory Palamas, brothers and sisters. You're getting a taste of the greatness of his teaching and the, the uh, beauty of his rhetoric and his, and his writings. Uh, which bring us to uh, orthodox piety and orthodox theology. This is just a taste, just what has references his stance with regard to the Latins of his day. And uh, we need to remember now, he is not some kind of peculiar uh, uh, original thinker. All right? This is one who's following the Holy Father's and his teaching is the theology of the church. Some want to say there's a palamism or there's a new neo palamism and all this nonsense of 20 and 21st century academic theology, always trying to coin terms and be original and, and give us insights into the Holy Fathers. We don't need that. We need the Holy Fathers and their writings. We can make a judgment on our own. And when we actually come to read their writings, we see that there, there is a harmony, a consensus of the Fathers. St. Gregory is following the Holy Fathers. That's what makes him great. So he's not creating anything new. There's nothing unique uh, in his teaching uh, in the sense that it's new. But what's unique is the, is, is the grace of God and, and, the, and the talent that he had to express things and the faithfulness that he had to resist the heresy and to confess the faith in his day. That's what makes, of course, his way, his way of life, his, his spiritual life and all the rest. Uh, that was exalted and lived in the spirit of God, his experience of God. Anyway, this is uh, just a, a taste of his stance. And we, we can see the ecclesiological stance that he has as it pertains to uh, the papal Protestant confession and how much different that is from what we hear today among uh, those who have embraced the new ecumenistic ecclesiology, uh, which would like to relativize and, uh, and, 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 and just brush over di differences like the filioque or uh, the other various heterodox teachings that have developed. This is now, we're now 700, 600 and some years after St. Gregory. 
and much more has been added to the cacodoxies, the pseudodoxies of the Latins. We have, this is long before the Magna Conception, long before uh, the uh, uh, papal infallibility, long before the new ecclesiology of Vatican II. Uh, it's, it's, it's long before uh, the flowering in terms of uh, the, the, the fleshing out of the teachings, the various teachings on original sin and other things. But it is not, it, already in this time, you'll see in St. Gregory Paul and Moss, but also in St. Mark of Ephesus, the whole question of the divine essence and energies, the distinction that's been made in his writings, that is all right there in the teachings of St. Gregory and in his uh, war uh, against the heresies and illusions of Barlam. Uh, but we're not going to be able to go into that. It's not our topic tonight. Uh, our topic is ecclesiology and what St. Gregory has to say about the church and heresy. And so we've seen... Uh, from his own words, just how decisive and how uh, clear he is on the boundaries of the church and the status of the papal Protestant confession. Uh, so let's continue and look at one of his close uh, contemporaries, but also I would say basically a disciple, uh, one who made his theology, took his theology and applied it to sacramental theology. Very important. And we see in his writings uh, the, the same spirit, the same outlook as St. Gregory Palamas, uh, known for his total unity of inspiration and purpose with St. Gregory. Uh, an original exponent, St. Nicholas, lived in the 1319 to 1392. And so he's... Uh, a contemporary with St. Gregory, a little bit younger, about 20, 20 years younger than St. Gregory. He lives about 30 years more than St. Gregory. Uh, but he is uh, a uh, uh, friend and contemporary with all those who are in this whole discussion uh, and the, all the debates around St. Gregory's theology of Barlam. He's right there. And then he, he turns his work to express orthodox teaching about the mysteries and about the divine liturgy. He has two great, great books, uh, both of them have existed in English, on the divine liturgy and life in Christ. Now, life in Christ is an amazing uh, uh, explanation of our, of our life in the mysteries in the church. Uh, anyone who can get, get that and read that and use that as a catechism, it's a phenomenal text, and it's very deep. And again, it's bringing to bear... Uh, in this in this way of analysis of the life of Christ, the theology of the fathers, including St. Gregory Palamas. So he succeeds in defending a theology of communion with God without being either a scholastic or polemical. Uh, his teachings were not meant to be polemical against the particular heresy of the day, but they do show the a clear reading of his writings would show clearly the impossibility of Barlam and scholastic and Thomistic theology. It's, uh, it's impossible to reconcile the two. What St. Gregory rendered in terms of concepts, St. Nicholas expressed as an existential reality, not only for the Hesychus monks, but for every Christian. So St. Gregory Palamas came, from, came down from the Holy Mouth of the Thessaloniki and taught that every Christian Every Christian should say the Jesus Prayer, should be his night and day remembrance of God, stand in remembrance of God with the Jesus Prayer. And it's not just for monks. And St. Nicholas comes and says, this reality, this existential, experiential reality of the grace of God in the mysteries and in the spiritual life is not just for the Hesychus monks, but for every Christian. So they're basically doing the same work of bringing the spiritual life to the people uh, throughout the uh, throughout the church, to understand the theological achievement, Father John Meindorf, I'm quoting Father John Meindorf here. To understand the theological achievement of the 14th century, it is essential to read both Saint Gregory and Saint Nicholas together. An ecclesiology understood through the Eucharist. This is this is uh, we're talking about Eucharistic ecclesiology today. This is probably one of the most the first and most uh, systematic or extensive explanations 
uh, of this. And of course, he didn't call it used to Eucharistic theology. It's very, it's very trendy today to talk about that. It's just, it's just the life in Christ, and the Eucharist is the center, and everything is in that context. So it's just, it, it comes out very naturally, which is, uh, the Eucharist is the completion of all the mysteries, not simply one of them. Uh, it's the origin and the completion, I would say, of all the mysteries. It's, it's in that context that everything is worked out. A spiritual life founded upon a living experience of Christ is an exponent of this, uh, and a theocentric anthropology. These legacies of St. Nicholas are clearly opposed to the ideal and the ideology of the humanists, including Barlam and Nikiforos and uh, Kindinos and all the rest. So this was a major... Uh, player and proponent of, of the patristic teaching against his contemporaries. He knew and was friends with some of the very ones who would apostate to Catholicism uh, and, 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 and lead the charge for a false union with St. Mark, as we'll see in a, in, in a bit. He was friends with them and he wrote against uh, them. He parted company with them and followed St. Gregory. Uh, his, his, his brother was also uh, uh, involved became a successor of St. Gregory Palamas at the, in the Sea of Thessaloniki. Uh, so this was all, they were all, uh, as a word, if you think about the four centuries with the three great hierarchs, you have in the 14th century, you have St. Nicholas Cabasilas, St. Gregory Palamas, St. Philothios, Patriarch of Constantinople, and others. In the Sacred Mysteries, he writes, and this is very important for us now to understand our ecclesiology as it pertains to the mysteries. The church is known in her mysteries, he says, in his commentary on the divine liturgy. Very important, the church is known in her mysteries. So where are the mysteries? They're the church. This is why it's absolutely insane for people to talk about there being baptism outside the church. The church is known in her mysteries. If there's baptism outside the church, the church is there, so it's not outside the church. You can't, you can't have that, it's not possible. So the minute you say that the church recognizes mysteries, baptism, chrismation, ordination, the Eucharist, among whatever confession it might be, you're actually saying that confession is the church. We don't believe in any kind of, there's no no room in any of this theology of St. Gregory Palamas, St. Nicholas Cavazos, to talk about there being partial communions or incomplete communion or, uh, uh, you know, local churches that are yet not full churches. This is all language of Vatican II. So without me actually going through it and pointing out, this is all answering the contemporary ecumenistic ecclesiology. This is an answer to all of the contemporary theories uh, that, have, that have departed from the patristic consensus. That's why it's, it's jarring and, and, and shocking to read a very prominent uh, theologian from England who's written many texts, many Orthodox texts, at the end of his many years of writing, to come and say that he recognized the Eucharist of the Latin papal Protestant confession as the Eucharist, as the, as the church's Eucharist, as the, as the one and only Eucharist. Well, then you recognize Catholicism as a part of the church, and therefore you have an ecumenistic ecclesiology you've embraced and a heretical teaching. Uh, it's tragic. It's um, it's hard to to swallow and accept. And one goes again and again in prayer and, and and in their in their mind to say this is not possible. That after reading so many fathers and te and writing so many books, that one could come to such a basic error that is impossible to reconcile with Saint Nicholas and Saint Gregory and Saint Mark and all the rest of the saints. So in the sacred mysteries, we uh, we are begotten and formed and wondrously united to the Savior. For they are the means by which, as St. Paul says, in him we live and move and have our being. Two things then commend us to God. And in them lies all the salvation of men. The first is that we be initiated into the most sacred mysteries. And the second, that we train the will for virtue. This is from uh, Life in Christ pages 49 and then 110. So two things are inseparable. Here is an answer to the various extremes in contemporary 
ecclesiological circles. We have people who stress the Eucharistic and Eucharistic ecclesiology to the detriment or to the uh, ignoring the, the equally important aspect of the ascetic life and the virtues. And you have others who only speak about the ascetic life and the virtues and don't understand the importance of the Eucharistic assembly. These are both uh, errors. They are inseparable. They presuppose one or the other. You cannot be in the Eucharist and, and live a fruitful life without an ascetic life, without overcoming the passions and becoming trained in virtue and freed from the various passions. The, the grace of God will not, will not dwell and abide and bring fruit in such a, such a passioned and worldly soul. So these two things are inseparable. But if you, as some say, well, everyone who attends divine liturgy should commune. We've heard that now from academic theologians or or uh, there there is um uh doesn't matter if you do the holy prayers be holy communion if you're in church you need to commune and, and other such nonsense look if we're not living ascetically being purified overcoming the passions being trained in virtue we can commune every day we can commune 10 times a day it won't matter Communion is not magical. It presupposes our synergy, our working together with God, and our, our, our not put, erecting obstacles, which are the passions and the, and the pride and all the rest. So these two things are inseparable. And this is an answer to the various uh, very idealistic and superficial and naive theologies and theories of the church, which neglect the foundation of a life in Christ, uh, which is the whole path of purification and asceticism is presupposed when we approach the mysteries. And so St. Nicholas doesn't just present a theory about mysteries, but he says, look, both of them are inseparable. I'm going to talk about the mysteries, but it is presupposed that you have this training in the virtue. And then we're going to look at him and what he says here about the unity of the mysteries. Very important. Very important today. Again, answering, uh, without going into a lot of detail, I'm answering all of the various theories, the ecumenistic theories that you might encounter uh, about there being mysteries outside the church, as we said earlier. Uh, but basically, the idea that the, there's not a unity of the mysteries in the one mystery of the church, and that, of course, presuppose, is presu it's presupposed that we have orthodox faith and uh, orthodox uh, dogma and ethos. All of these things are inseparable. There's no discounting. There's no, well, if you have 30%, 90%, you have, therefore, uh, the, the experience of Christ. Christ is only full, brothers and sisters. Talk about fullness. Say, I've, I've found the fullness of the faith. People talk about this. And what they mean is that they had understood. They had, they had a lot of right doctrine, but then they had, a, they had all wrong, wrong doctrine as well. They had Protestants who say, well, I didn't understand what it meant, the doctrine of the Eucharist or the church, the ecclesiology, or the place of the mother of God. And now I do, and now I've come to the fullness. And so they're talking about qu a quantitative question, qu a question of, of, of not having any heresy and having all the right doctrines. And that, that's true on that level, but that's not the level of experience of Christ in Christ in the church. So when one becomes a Christian and embraces Christ and, be, and puts on Christ, there's only fullness. Christ is never partially there. He's all, when we commune of him, it's all of him. Every, every particle that every person takes, there's not, it's not a part of Christ. It's all of Christ. Christ is inseparable. In every part, there is the whole. So there's never any part that is not the whole. It's not, it can't be, you can't make it piecemeal. You can't chop it up. You can't distribute it and say you have 20%, you have 10% of Christ. And that's the same thing. We're talking about the mysteries. The mysteries are are only uh, there's only one mystery at the end of the day. It's Christ and His incarnation. Every other mystery is 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 a living out in that. Just like we have the divine energies, there's essentially one divine energy, but then there's many divine energies as well, right? It's the same way when we're talking about the mysteries. So it's it, it's a mystery of the unity of of God, the unity. The simplicity of, 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 of God, the simplicity of the Holy Spirit, and yet the, the, the multiplicity. Uh, we'll talk about that in a future in future uh, lectures here. So let's go back to the text here. 
Now, indeed, Christ is present in each of the mysteries, St. Nicholas says. It is with himself that we are uh, anointed and washed. That's a typo. He is also our feast. He is present with those who are being initiated and imparts his gifts to them. The mode, however, is not entirely the same. As he washes them in baptism, he cleanses them from the filth of wickedness and imposes his own form upon them. See how important the form is. Imposes his own form upon them. When he anoints them, he activates the energies of the spirit. Plural, energies of the spirit. He activates, energizes. The, this, this language, some pe people think it belongs to some contemporary uh, Romanian or uh, Romanidi uh, theologian or something. This is, this is patristic, folks. He activates the energies of the spirit of which he, for the sake of, a, of our flesh, became the treasury. But when he has led the initiate to the table and has given him his body to eat, he entirely changes him and transforms him into his own state. The clay is no longer clay when it has received the royal likeness, but it is already the body of the king. It is already the body of the king. This is ecclesiological. This is a question of ecclesiology, what the church is. So when you take up the mysteries, he says, uh, the royal likeness, right? The, the, the image and likeness, the royal likeness is already the, is already the body of the king. You've already become, you are members of the body. It is impossible to conceive anything more blessed than this. There's nothing more blessed than partaking worthily and of the holy mysteries, having the energies activated within you. It is therefore the final mystery as well, since it is not possible to go beyond it or to, typo, add anything to it. There's nothing beyond the mystery of the Eucharist. Saint, we, we, we talked about St. Ignatius in our second lesson, I think it was, or maybe even first, uh, and how it's, there's nothing, you don't, you don't do, the, it's an end in itself, the mysteries. Uh, it doesn't exist for some other reason. And so this, if we understand this properly, we understand the whole social gospel, uh, 21st century transformation of Christian uh, Christianity into serving the needs of the worldly person and his, you know, the peace and security of the world. That twisting and perverting of the social aspect of the of the of, of the application of the gospel, and and, and essentially making it autonomous. That's, that's a total, totally unorthodox and perverted and ultimately satanic distortion of the church. There's nothing beyond, and the end of our life is partaking of the mysteries, the body and blood of Christ. There's nothing beyond, there's nothing greater, but it, it, doing it worthily. That's the whole question of the ascetic life, purification, confession, and all the rest, which pre, is presupposed. And it's in this context that all this happens. The first mystery, baptism, clearly needs the middle one, chrismation. And that in turn stands in need of the final mystery. After the Eucharist then, there is nowhere further to go. There we must stand and try to examine the means by which we may preserve the treasure to the end. There's so much here to unpack. Unfortunately, we can't go very deep. But what we need to focus on and, and stress here is that the mysteries, baptism, chrismation, and the final mystery of the Eucharist clearly need each other. In other words, they're inseparable. So coming to the contemporary humanistic ecclesiology that we see on, uh, on uh, showcase in Vatican II, they can talk about, which is impossible, it's impossible, but they do it, it's, ins it's insanity. They can talk about there being... People initiated into the church, the mystery of the church, with baptism alone, never chrismated, not communing, because they don't have it. Protestants don't even believe in it. But the Roman Catholic, Vatican II, Papal Protestant Confession believes that those people who are baptized, wherever they're baptized, whatever Protestant confession, if it's done in the Trinity with water, and the intention is to do what the church does, they are baptized. 
But here we see that baptism needs chrismation and needs the Eucharist. We see that it's inseparable. We see that they lead one to another, and that, that, that it's impossible for them to exist outside the context of the mystery of the church. This is St. Nicholas explaining to us the patristic mind, and of course, St. Gregory Palamas' theology is all consistent here. So it's, it's insanity. It's not just heresy. It's insanity. To talk about people being initiated into the life of Christ without the Eucharist, without any participation in the Eucharist, it being a partial initiation. There is, again, no partial anything in Christ. You are receiving the full Christ, fully initiated. And how that's appropriated is another question. On your, And that has to do with your own stance and freedom and how much you're conforming to the image, you're allowing to be the Christ conform you to the image, how, how much you are in synergy in cooperation with the grace. That's a different question. It's not an ecclesiological question. You're talking about ecclesiology and the mysteries and what they mean and what they are. And so then he says, but there we must stand in the Eucharist and try to examine the means by which we may preserve the treasure to the end. That whole preserving the treasure to the end is the whole ascetic life, the science of the spiritual life, uh, and so much so much there. Go and read The Life in Christ by St. Nicholas Kavasinos, published by St. Vladimir Serbian Press. I don't know if they've got a, uh, I don't know what the status of that publication is. I've got a very old version. So, but find it and read it. Uh, it is essential reading for anyone who wants to go into the deep theology of St. Gregory Palamas applied to the sacramental life, the mystical life. So let's go to St. Mark of Ephesus here. Probably well known to most of you, well known to everyone who's among the Orthodox, certainly. St. Mark of Ephesus lived in the last, later half of the, the very last part of the 14th century. So we saw that the year that St. Nicholas Cavasilas, let's go back and make sure, the year that he reposed, St. Saint Mark was born. So St. Mark is following immediately upon the, these pillars of Orthodoxy. St. Gregory and St. Nicholas, and he's continuing in the tradition. He's a Palamite, so-called. So I don't like that term at all, but he is a lover of St. Gregory Palamas and follows in the patristic teaching that he taught and defends it at in, in, in the Council of Florence. Of course, the great event of his life and what we remember him for is his defense of orthodoxy, his courageous defense at the Council of Florence in 1439 AD. So that is, he is... At that point, almost, what, uh, 47 years old, he reposes in 1444. So he's a young man, 54 years old, I think he reposes. Is that correct? Somewhere around there. And he, uh, he stands for orthodoxy over against not just a few heretics here or there, but against his own emperor, John the Eighth, Paleologos, and Pope Rome of Rome, Evgenios the Fourth. In other words, against the whole known powers of the Christian Church at the time, he stands against them and he refuses to budge. And of course, we know that he, uh, his faithfulness, is what kept Orthodoxy from falling away uh, into uh, heresy. Uh, he reposes again in 1444. On his deathbed, he implores, his, he implores his disciple, Gregory, the later patriarch, Gennadios II of Constantinople, to be careful of the snares of the West and to defend orthodoxy. Uh, he, of course, stood against the filioque. He stood against the primacy the juris of jurisdiction of the Pope and the purgatory fire and the, uh, the enzymes and the various innovations of uh, the West. His feast day is on the 19th of January. Now, today we hear, again, our interest is what's going on today in the church to help you to decipher it all and make, make your way through it in an orthodox way. Today we see people talking about St. Mark as an ecumenist. St. Mark went and had a dialogue, and they want to just talk about the first, very first part, the very beginning of the whole uh, question of St. Mark's witness at the Council of Florence. And so some say he recognized Rome to be a church. They quote him selectively, and they say he recognized that, that in fact, it being almost 400 years after uh, the uh, schism, 
that you have, uh, you still have a church. In other words, we have a divided church. They want to say that we have a divided church. St. Mark of Ephesus, the great defender of orthodoxy, teaches that, in fact, we have a, a divided church, an ecumenistic ecclesiology. Is that true? Well, Metropolitan Herodes Vlacos answered that. We have it on our website. You can check out the, the, the link below. And he's quoting a various witnesses here, historical, uh, to the truth of the matter. And he quotes Professor Ioannis Karimiris, who was a predecessor, reposed in the, I think, 70s. Uh, he was uh, a mixed bag in terms of dogmatic theology, unfortunately. But anyway, he's quoting now the major sources for the Acts of the Council, and Syropoulos is one of them. He's an important historian. And he says, in Florence, too, Mark of Genicos said to the Orthodox delegates, quote, that the Latins are not only schismatics, but heretics as well. And our church kept this in secret, for our nation was much weaker than theirs, unquote. And those before us did not wish to proclaim the Latins as heretics, looking forward to their return and negotiating their friendship, unquote. So he, he's quoting the sources of the council as saying that St. Mark held from the beginning, as, as did all the saints, including St. Saint Gregory Palamas, who came before him. I mean, this is not a, this is, this is ridiculous. It's ridiculous to think that St. Mark didn't think that there was heresy when he's following St. Gary Palmas, who clearly states there's heresy. And he's very familiar, obviously, with his teaching on the procession of the Holy Spirit. He would have read the text. So it's just disingenuous of people to say today, oh, yeah, he considered there to be a, a divided church. When you say there's heresy, you no longer are speaking of the church. There's not a heretical church. This is the delusion of the Council in Crete when they said we believe in a heterodox church. Is there such a thing as a heterodox church? Brothers and sisters, we're doing here ecclesiology, theology, dogmatic theology. There's no such thing as a heterodox church. There's only, we're talking about it dogmatically, right? Church meaning the body of Christ. There's no such thing as a heretical body of Christ. There's no such thing as a virgin who's also a prostitute. Those things are impossible. So uh, the idea that St. Mark, the defender of orthodoxy, figured out that they were heretical only after the Council of, uh, of Florence is ridiculous. It's called pastoral and diplomatic stance in order to hopefully bring those who've fallen away back to the faith and back to the communion of the church. According to the Acts and Memoirs of the Flora, Fiora Florence Council, St. Mark of has always considered the Latins as heretics. And he said so to the Orthodox delegation, but the delegation of the Orthodox Church did not want to express it publicly because of the difficult conditions of the time and as an expression of friendship, hoping for their return. But of course, St. Mark of is after the council, when he saw the actual attitude of the Latins, expresses himself in very harsh terms, very clear and, and, and polemical terms, which was necessary at the time to protect the faithful from falling away and falling after the Unions, those who had unified in a, in a false council with the Latins. He sent the well-known letter, which we're going to quote from now, Orthodox, to Orthodox Christians everywhere across the land and the islands. This is toward the end of his life, and now he knows he's approaching his end. And he, and he sends his letter to all the Orthodox to help keep them from the delusion of the false council. So he replies to the claim that the Latins were only schismatics. We see that today. In fact, we have hierarchs in the ecumenical patriarchate who have stated it at the time of Crete that, in fact, they're not heretics, not even schismatics. We simply have a break in communion. You hear this among those who are, who are, uh, have, have great desire for union, who are undiscerning, who are, uh, for whatever reason, they're, they're ignoring the witness of the Holy Fathers and the saints of our day as well, but, but although going back for a thousand years, you hear them talk about these various theories uh, well, that were two lungs of the same body. This is a theory of, I think, John Paul II, uh, that we have this common baptism, all these theories that you hear. Take that apply that to the words of the saints and you'll see how far they are from the Holy Fathers. They're not following the Holy Fathers of the church. They're creating 
theories for the sake of their own desires, for whatever reasons they have for wanting a, a union. Of course, we all want all people to be united in Christ and in one communion. No one who's a Christian could ever want anything but that. But when we talk about wanting a union, we're talking about it in a way which is not according to the Father. It's a false counsel, a false union, which will not bring about salvation, but further falling away of not only those who are already outside in delusion, but even the Orthodox themselves. This is the great danger. So it was, he says, it was they, St. Mark, he says in his letter, it was they who gave grounds for the schism by openly making the addition to Filioque, which until then they had spoken in secret. In other words, he said they had kept it for hundreds of years away from the question of East-West Rome had fought against it. We saw that in our previous lecture. So uh, that's what he means by they spoke it in secret. In other words, they it, 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 it existed in the West, it circulated in the West, but it was not brought as a confession of faith until the schism, essentially. Right? Rome didn't embrace it and, and defend it until long after the 8th Ecumenical Council, about the time of the schism. 1014 is when it was finally introduced in Rome. And they had spoken in secret while we were the first to separate ourselves from them, or rather to separate and cut them off from the common body of the church. When did that happen? People think that happened in 1054. No. 1054, that was, that was 30, uh, let's see, 30 years, no, 40 years after it happened. 1014 is when they were cut off. The diptychs. The cessation of commemoration because of the introduction of the Filioque. Probably in 1009, 1014, we have them getting cut out of the diptychs. In other words, they're not commemorated any longer by the Eastern Patriarchs or at least by the Patriarch of Constantinople. So what, what we have in 1054 is them coming back and answering what had already been established, a, cease, a cessation of communion and a rejection of their orthodoxy. And they're, and they're, they're no longer being in community of the church. They've rejected them in the East. And that's why they were already baptizing. That's why they already they already accused them at 1054. If, if for those in Patreon who saw the post I made, I gave you the uh, the testimony of Cardinal Humbert, or uh, maybe I'm not saying his word his, his name right. The Cardinal who came and uh, set the bull of excommunication uh, in, in in Hagia Sophia. We read in there he's accusing them of, of heresies, accusing the Orthodox of heresies, and one of them is being like the Arians and baptizing. The Latins. So obviously that there was already a break. 1054 is not the break. 1014, 1009 is when they introduced the heresy. So he's saying we cut them off. The Orthodox cut the Latins off first for heresy. Not a schism. There's so much misinformation about this. He says, we cut them off. Why may I ask? Now listen, he's becoming he's, he's ironic now. It's very interesting how he deals with this. Because they have the right faith and have made the addition to the creed in an orthodox fashion, is that why we cut them off? Surely, whoever would begin to talk like that would not be in their right mind. They're not right in the head, he says. But rather because they have an absurd and impious opinion and for no, other, no reason at all made the addition. There were no justification for the addition. He says it's unjustified, totally unjustified, the addition. And so we have turned away from them as from heretics and have shunned them. And yet you still have Orthodox people, Orthodox hierarchs, Orthodox theologians, who are talking about one church, one body, common mysteries, no heresy, just a schism, not even a schism, even maybe even just a break in communion. Like he said, this, this hierarch. I'll say his name. He's publicly said it. Why? Why would I? Why? He's proud of his opinion. This is Bishop Job of the Ecumenical Patriarchate, who is in uh, was in Western Europe. I'm not sure where he is now, uh, what his hierarchy status is. I think he's just uh, serving the Patriarchate in various ways. But he said he said there. It's like the break in in uh, commemoration communion between Antioch and Jerusalem. I mean, you've got to you've got to be either cynical or not not been orthodox a week to, to say such things. Read the Holy Fathers, the saints. What did they say? What did they teach? Uh, and so he goes on, St. Mark says, what more is necessary? 
The pious canons speak thus, quote, he is a heretic and subject to the canons against heretics who even slightly departs from the Orthodox faith, unquote. These are the canons of the church. He's quoting, summarizing. If then the Latins do not at all depart from the correct faith, we have evidently cut them off unjustly. And you know what? That's what essentially has been posited in ecumenical, humanistic ecclesiology. And if you go back to the, excuse me, if you go back to the uh, Balamand agreement, that's essentially what they're saying. Why are we divided? Because we're bigots. Because we're racist. Because I don't know what, choose your, 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 your social warrior phrase as you like, whatever you want to, however you want to phrase it. It's, it's not because of the faith. That's what, that's the, that's the, the conclusion that you have to come to. And that's what Father John Romanides came to when his analysis of the um, agreement in Balaman. People who support the Balaman agreement have to come to absurdities and say that we've been apart from Latins, we've cut them off because of ignorance and bigotry. And for a thousand years, we're just insisting. If you recognize the mysteries, that's what you have to say. Why do we? Why would we say that Christ is there and not commune with Him? So, let's be honest and consistent here, and not talk in absurdities and foolishness. He says, "We, have, if, if that's the case, if they've not departed at all from the correct faith, we have cut them off unjustly. But if they have thoroughly departed from the faith." And that in connection with the theology of the Holy Spirit, blasphemy against whom is the greatest of all perils, then it is clear that they are heretics and we have cut them off as heretics. So there's, he's saying, look, our stance cannot be explained otherwise. Say what you want. Create what you want. There's no other conclusion than that we have considered them to be heretics from the time that we cut them off, 1014, not 54, and this is the case of uh, the, 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 the reality of things here. St. Mark confessing the faith for us. So obvious and simple, but the passions and the arrogance and the pride and the, the lust for power and, and the political machinations and the, and the powers that be and the, uh, all of the evil forces behind ecumenism today, they, 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 they cloud everything and make it hard for us to see that the, the obvious truth of, of that are that is proclaimed by our holy fathers. Now, wh wh what did Saint Mark? How does Saint Mark consider them? He, he put them in the same category as the Arians and the Eunomians. He says, at the time, he's talking about the practice they had at the time of anointing them with chrism. This is long before Trent, right, and long before a codification of a departure from the form and the and the, and the type of baptism, and and. It's, 1917, you have canon law confirming a practice that had been going on for centuries, saying that, no, immersion is not the norm. We don't do that. Normally, we, we, we either pour or sprinkle. So this is the context. We don't, confuse, don't get confused with thinking that St. Mark's talking about our context or even the last 500 years, right? This is before Trent, before the codification of the departure from uh, the... Orthodox baptism, in other words, immersion. And he says, why do we anoint with chrism those whom, of them who come to us? Some people say, we're well, we, we, we anoint them with chrism because they're not heretics. Well, no, that's not accurate. Let's go back to the Second Ecumenical Council, the Seventh Canon. And he says, look at all the, these heretics. They were all anointed with, with chrism. So this is, go, drives home the point, the idea that people, people say, well, we receive this group because they're closer, another group because we chrismate them because they're closer, and we baptize those because they're further away. But that's not true at all. Second, again, the council, Canon 7 is chrismating the worst of heretics. So it's not what they believe that is decisive and how we're going to deal with them. Again and again, we have to point this out and stress this. It's not the particular degree of delusion or heresy or rejection of Christ that will be determinative of our pastoral economic reception or not of a group, not an individual, but a group of, that's coming back to us, all right? Massive, you know, amounts of people who are coming back. That economy, which is allowed, not imposed every time, but is allowed 
for the sake of the management of the house, it's not going to be determined on the fact that they're heretics or not. They're schismatics, we're going to chrismate them. It doesn't follow. It's very clear in Canon 7, St. Mark is saying here for us. So do you see, he says, with whom we number those who come from the Latins? If all those are heretics, then it is clear that these are the same. Can't we find a middle ground for union? Oh, we hear that all the time today. There's always this, there's an attempt now to narrow the problems down. Our academic theologians have, have, have solved it supposedly for us. And the same with the Monophysite question. We have a, a group of academic theologians, and now they've come to the conclusion that actually there was no real heresy and they're all orthodox. Guess what? We don't work like that. That's never been our way. And, and when they did attempt to do that, like in, like in Florence, they sent people who were really not representative of the Orthodox tradition, Gemistos Plithon, or Vesarion, or, or uh, 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 who was the other uh, that went along? That was, they were humanists. They were humanists. Father John Robinides points this out in his book. He says, uh, you know, we know that they were part of a, a pagan sect. Gemistos uh, 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 Plithon, Plethon, I forget how you, I'm not saying his, his name right. I, I, it's one of my my Achilles' heels is keeping names right. Um, he 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 admits in his writings that he had he had apostatized. He was he was a total hypocrite in Florence, and yet he was supposedly supporting Saint Mark initially. So so when we have these kind of committees, never to go that doesn't go well. Things don't go well with committees. So we have committees now deciding what is orthodox. It doesn't work like that in the Orthodox Church. We have saints in council, not just councils, but saints in councils, who will then rightly divide the word of truth. Every great council had a saint that spoke on behalf, and the fathers there embraced the God-inspired words of the saints. And if, if that, and that's always the case, that Orthodoxy is saved even by one, St. Athanasius, St. Maximus, St. Mark, even one or two or three can save. So those who are on the verge of departing for a various various other solutions outside the church, on the right and the left, remember, just a few people have saved the church again and again. Don't lose heart. Don't get fed up. Don't say it's all over. Apostasy is everywhere. There was apostasy everywhere in the Iconoclast period. There was apostasy everywhere in St. Mark's day. St. Mark was in exile, essentially, writing to people on his deathbed. What, what would he have thought? Oh, let's go start a sect or a segment or let's create a schism or whatever it is that you think might be a better solution than fighting for the faith and confessing the faith right here in the community of the church. That's the methodology of the fathers. Let's be on guard for the machinations of the enemy is to disintegrate the unity of the four orthodox and, and make it even easier for the heretical minded to win the day. There'll be no base, no no confessing uh, people of God and a monastic segment. So let's get back to this idea. Can we find a middle ground for union? And St. Mark says, but if, they say, we had devised some middle ground between dogmas, then thanks to this we would have united with them and accomplished our business superbly without at all having been forced to say anything again except what corresponds to custom. And as has been handed down. <clears throat> this is precisely the means by which many from of old have been deceived and persuaded to follow those who have led them off to the steep precipice of impiety, believing that there is some sort of middle ground between two teachings that can reconcile obvious contradictions. They have been exposed to peril. So this St. Mark is speaking to all of us, all of you out there, who want to achieve a false union by saying that we found some formula by which we can have a papal primacy which is acceptable to the Orthodox, as if this dogma is the only thing that's separating us, as if there's not a whole experience behind this and a whole mentality, a whole outlook, a whole fronima, which is totally opposed, as if there's not other dogmas like created grace or, or uh, immaculate conception and ancestral sin and, and, and the list goes on. That is not an expression of the patristic mind. As if they've not embraced gross heresy in Pentecostalism and charismatic, the mo charismatic movement and the delusions that exist there. 
with the Pope blessing them every year. The, the list goes on and on, on and on. There's new heresies with Vatican II, new delusions. And yet we're supposed to believe that the dialogue the official dialogue is close to reaching a solution if they can just figure out how to talk about primacy. It's really an insult to the Orthodox conscience and sentiments and to the Holy Fathers. St. Mark goes on. If the Latin dogma is true that the Holy Spirit proceeds from, also from the Son, then, also, then ours is false that states that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. And this is precisely the reason for which we separated from them. And if ours is true, then without a doubt, theirs is false. What kind of middle ground can there be between two such judgments? There can be none, unless it were some kind of judgment suitable to both the one and the other, like a boot that fits both feet. And will this unite us? Of course not. There's no unity. Unity is not so superficial, so, so twisted, so convoluted but it arises from a common life and a common experience. What about those who maintain a middle ground? What should we do with them? And he's talking about the, the Latinizers, the, the unions of his day. And he's talking about the patriarch. We have, he wanted nothing to do. And he said, I want nothing to do with him. Make sure he does not come to my funeral. This is the decisiveness that was necessary to keep orthodoxy alive at this time of betrayal. And he says, Someone will say, how shall we regard those moderate Greco-Latins who maintain a middle ground, openly favor some of the Latin rites and dogmas, favor but do not wish to accept others, uh, and entirely disapprove of others? In other words, you have this, this, this confused union of, and, 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 and uh, well, this is good, that, that's not good, and it's, it, there's no, no clarity, but there's a union, there's a unity. Uh, he says, look, Flee from them as one flees from a snake. As from the Latins themselves. Flee from the Latinizers, those who are, who are unified or uni, un, uniting themselves and acting as if they're all uni, claiming unity, all, all this, this mentality without any repentance, without any return to the patristic mind. Those you flee as from a snake, he says. Or it may, it may be from those who are even worse than they, as from buyers and sellers of Christ. Buyers and sellers of Christ. God help us. God help us. For they, as the apostle says, suppose that gain is godliness, of whom he adds, flee these. For they go over to them, not in order to learn, but for gain. Material gain, he means. Quote, what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? And, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? All right. Let's go on quickly, because we're, we're way over time, to just what he does, what he rejects in, in particular in his encyclical to all the Orthodox Christians. Now, he goes through and he says the various aspects of the question. I'm not going to go through them. You can come back to the PDF. You can pause it later and look at these and examine these. This is an exact quote from his encyclical. And he says, look, I'm, we're following the Damascene on this point. We do not say the Spirit proceeds from the Father. We're following the, the divine Dionysius, Aeropagite, er, and say that the Father is the sole source of the supernatural divinity. We follow Gregory the Theologian, who distinguished the Father from the Son in his capacity of being caused. We don't follow the Latins. And, and, he, and he goes on. You can read it yourself. We don't follow the Latins in that teaching. We don't follow that teaching. We follow the Holy Father, St. Maximus. And the Romans of that time, who are Orthodox, who do not make the Son the cause of the Spirit, even though they, they have a form that is like the Filioque, in reality, it's totally not the Filioque in understanding, because it has only the, only the Father as the cause. It does not make the Son the cause of the Spirit. And, and people want to say, well, St. Maximus embraced the Filioque. That's a total, uh, that's erroneous. Understanding St. Maximus' the whole theology and what he means and how he's trying to embrace the Orthodox version or understanding, and that is not the one that was adopted in the West and has been defended for the last thousand years. If that was the case, we would have a union a long time ago. In fact, it was presented in, at, at the Council of Florence, and they, and they didn't want to accept it. They didn't want to believe it. They wanted to call on Maximus, and when they realized they couldn't call on Maximus, they, they left it. 
So that is an orthodox understanding. Together with the philosopher and Martin Justin, we affirm as the Son is from the Father, so the Spirit is from the Father, and not the Latins who say both. And together with the Damascene and all the fathers, we confess that it is known, it is not known to us in what consists the difference between generation and procession, while they, together with Thomas and the Latins, say that the difference consists in this, the generation is immediate and procession immediate. So you remember what St. Gregory Palamas was saying about the same topic, right? So he's saying, we don't follow the Latins on that. We, we follow the fathers who say, we don't know what the difference between generation and procession consists. We're not so bold and so foolish as to imagine that we know the difference. And that reminds us of the Eunomians who supposed they knew the essence of God. And then he goes on and, and, and rejects created grace teaching and purgatory. We, f we forget that the created grace teaching goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. It's been condemned by the Orthodox Church in the person of St. Mark, uh, Saint Ma uh, Mark and St. Gregory. And he says, and we affirm in agreement with the fathers that the will and energy of the uncreated and the divine nature are uncreated. Well, they, together with the Latins and Thomas, say that will is identical with nature, but the divine energy is created, whether it be called divinity or the divine and a material light or the Holy Spirit or something else of this nature. And in some fashion, these poor people, these poor creatures, worship the created divinity and the created divine light and the created Holy Spirit. So here is an answer to all those who say, no, 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 the Latins don't teach and have never taught created grace. One could go on. I suggest a recent podcast last week. A group of wonderful Orthodox brothers got together and discussed this whole issue uh, over on Jay Dyer's um, uh, YouTube channel. A very good three hour discussion uh, between uh, uh, David and Snack and Father uh, Ananias. And it really does flesh out a lot of. Uh, looking at the the, the, uh, the Latin text and looking at the, the Orthodox teaching uh, fleshes out this whole question. And any of you out there who are who are saying, no, 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 we don't believe in creative grace, go look at that, 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 that recent podcast and look at the sources. They're all quoting right from Roman Catholic dogmatic sources and Thomas and to show the teaching because th there's a lot of confusion in the Latin teachings. They can, they can contradict themselves. They hold... In other places, St. Gregory Palamas is a saint and his teaching they embrace, and in other places they, they deny it and they, they, they reject it. And so there's, there's confusion. And so uh, I recommend that as uh, for further reading, as it were, on this particular topic. And then he goes on and he talks about purgatory. And we say that neither do the saints receive the kingdom and the unutterable blessings already prepared for them, nor are the sinners already sent to hell, but both await their fate which will be received in the future age after the resurrection and judgment. People ask a lot about this. What do we believe? We don't believe that there is a purgatorial fire. Absolutely not. Well, they, he's talking about together with the Latins, talking about the, the Greco-Latins, the Uniates. They've embraced these teachings at the Council of Florence. He says, together with the Latins, they desire immediately after death to receive according to their merits. And for those in an in immediate condition who have died in repentance, they give a purgatorial fire, which is not identical with that of hell. So that, as they say, having purified their souls by it after death, they also together with the righteous will enjoy the kingdom. This is contained in their conciliar decree, in other words, of Council of Florence. So we could say much, much more here, but the point here is we're making here is that St. Mark is making a concerted effort to delineate the various heresies and, and, and why we must reject the council and those who have embraced the council and those who've gone into communion with the Latins and why these, te these teachings are inconsistent. And this clarity needs to be refound by our ecclesiastical leadership and restated and no longer entertaining the idea of a middle ground, a, 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 a false and superficial. Uh, solution of only one minor problem as if that were the the case, as if that was the what needed to be solved. Then he goes on, he talks about papal primacy and unleavened bread. And he says, and we, obeying the apostles who have prohibited it, shun Jewish unleavened bread. Of course, 
to this day, the Latin communion has the wafers and the unleavened bread. They've never repented of that as being a problem. And don't see it as a problem. While well, they, in the same act of union, proclaim that is what is used in the service of Latins is the body of Christ. Uh, so, the question on unleavened bread. We're not going to go in, we're not going to have time to go into all these. And for us, the Pope is one of the patriarchs, and that alone, if he be Orthodox. If he's not Orthodox, he's not a Pope and a patriarch. There's this idea going around, well, we believe he's still the Pope, he's still a church somehow. He's, he's, I, I don't think this is this is tenable. This is not sustainable. This is not you don't find the Holy Fathers speaking of Rome post schism like that. I mean, Saint Mark is not talking about there being a Pope, but just no one on the seat at this time. So I don't think we can embrace that. Although it might be a very in, ingenious solution for a Latin minded to understand the Orthodox position, it doesn't really reflect uh, patristic teaching to my experience, my knowledge, uh, certainly St. Mark doesn't seem to uh, allow for that. If he be Orthodox, he is one of the patriarchs and nothing more. While they, with great gravity, proclaim him vicar of Christ, father and teacher of all Christians, may they be more fortunate than their father, who are also like him, for he does not greatly prosper, having an antipope at the time there were antipopes. And <laughs> so... Having an antipope who is the cause of sufficient unpleasantness, and they are not happy to imitate him. Uh, so St. Mark in this letter is a little bit cynical, right? A little bit uh, uh, kind of ma making a point with some gusto uh, to get the point across here of the absurdity of the whole thing. And so, brethren, flee. This is the last thing, and we'll open up for questions. I hope you have questions. You can ask your questions. And uh, we have... Uh, oh, one of our uh, friends here collecting the questions uh, in uh, YouTube and Facebook. And so, brethren, flee from them and from communion with them, for they are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Here there's no uh, seat that's been empty here, right? They're false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to the works. And the beloved disciple speaks thus, quote, If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, and give him no greeting, for he that give, for he that giveth him greeting is partaker in his evil deeds. Of course, he's quoting St. John the Theologian and his question, his, his uh, stance on those who teach heresy. Now, again, those who teach heresy are those who were in the church, departed from the church, refused the church, refused to listen to the church. That's the kind of heretic that we're talking about. Not somebody who grew up and is clueless, doesn't even know what the Orthodox Church is. All right, so make a distinction there. Uh, there is a pastoral distinction for those who are Orthodox who are living among non-Orthodox in Spain or wherever it might be in France or America. But here we're talking about those Greco-Latins who had embraced the false council, and he's saying have nothing to do with them. And that's a proper application of the gospel of the epistle of St. John, no doubt. Of course, having relations with heterodox no matter what is spiritually problematic. That's a different question. That's a question of discernment, a question of how we live amongst the heterodox in those questions, in those places, that's a different question. Uh, I don't want to say that it doesn't matter. You like you, you know, you can have uh, intimate relations with heterodox, and nothing it doesn't matter. No, that's not the case either. Right. So let's let's stay on the royal path here and not assume that because one is not absolutely applicable, therefore it doesn't matter. We'll talk about that in another context. Therefore, insofar as this is what has been commanded you by the holy apostles, stand aright, hold firmly the traditions which you have received, both by written and by word of mouth, that you be not deprived of your firmness if you are led away by the delusion of the lawless. May we have the blessings of the great hierarchs, the three great pillars of orthodoxy, the new three hierarchs, St. Gregory, Palamas, St. Photius the Great, and St. Mark of Ephesus. 
Uh, hopefully we've, in the short time that we've had, we presented to you high points, the most important aspects of their teaching on the church and heresy, the boundaries, and it's helped to answer your questions, your problems today. How do we deal with the ecumenistic mindset? How do we deal with the delusional ecumenistic ecclesiology? How do the saints deal with it? What do the saints have to say? Here we have a clear witness to their stance vis-a-vis the West and Catholicism. So let's take the first question. Let's open it up for questions. We also have questions uh, over at uh, Crowdcast. We'll get to those shortly. Uh, first question from someone here uh, at YouTube. Many are learning about the vaccine coming to Mount Athos and monks receiving it. This is scandalizing some. How should we understand what is happening on the Holy Mountain? All right, I'll quickly answer this because it's off topic, but it's important. A lot of people have been writing me saying they saw an article uh, which has been translated from Greek. Uh, I think it was the uh, Thema Orthodoxias or something that uh, originally published it. And it showed monks uh, at the uh, the health center in Karies getting the vaccine. Look, let's be honest, folks. We're in a time, if anybody's been paying any attention to this whole agenda in terms of the vaccine and what's going on in the world, there's a tremendous push for the masses to embrace the vaccine, to embrace, em, embrace the whole uh, narrative. And I've been talking about this demonic narrative for one year now. You can go back and listen to my podcast, The Demonic Methodology in the whole COVID narrative. I highly recommend two parts. Listen to that and, and understand in the, the proper context, when you see news reports of whatever it is, remember what we're talking about. We're not talking about Orthodox uh, Christians who are just reporting what they saw or heard, we have an agenda on the part of the mass media. And they want to achieve a certain result. I'm not going to go into a lot of details of what that is. There's a lot of discussion. People disagree. Uh, But there's no question that you can't just take a news report and say, oh, that must be the way it is. Now, this particular news report is is obvious to me, and having talked to other people here uh, and been here for now 22 years, going back and forth to the Holy Mountain, that this is not the Holy Mountain I know. It's not the Holy Mountain that's represented by most monks. It's the Holy Mountain that is, unfortunately, it reflects the world. It's the way things are. The Holy Mountain is not uh, immune from the various delusions. Uh, People can embrace them even on the Holy Mountain. But you have a few monks in a few monasteries, and essentially this is a propaganda piece. Some of them went and got vaccinated. Somebody said, let's write the piece and promote it. So that everybody will say, oh, the Holy Mountain is embraced. The Holy Mountain has embraced the vaccination. Monks are getting vaccinated. All the, mon- all the monasteries are in favor. It's nonsense. First of all, the Holy Community would never do that. And the monasteries as a whole would never would never even decide on such an issue. It's just not the way things are done. Everybody's conscience and on their own. And even in a monastery, they would never, they would never, I can't imagine even the worst monastery in terms of the questions of faith and and, and and confession of faith today. Those who are those who are going uh, the way of the world in terms of Ukraine and and ecumenism. Even in those minds, I can't imagine the abbot saying you're all going to get vaccinated or you need to be vaccinated or whatever. It's going to be a question of one's conscience. And so there are a few monks. There are two thousand some monks on Athos, obviously, right? There are tons of people on Athos laymen who are working there. So those people can and they have gone and gotten vaccinated. And they're from certain monasteries that are named in the article. Uh, the ones that I remember are, are the ones that are usually uh, supportive of the patriarchate in terms of Ukraine and, and ecumenism. So it doesn't really make an impression on me at all. I would call this a propaganda piece. Uh, in the best case scenario, I would call it a propaganda piece. And it's designed to do exactly what it's done, create a sense of panic that the Holy Mountain has fallen into a mass vaccination pro- program or something. It's not happening so just relax be at peace uh and it's not the end of the world uh so let's go on to the next uh quote or or question uh jorge uh if uh, i'm not baptized as orthodox are my prayers heard okay i want to get i'm going to get the questions that i have to do a little bit about what we talked about tonight let's start with that one in light of the patristic teaching of St. Mark of Ephesus, would we even consider Roman Catholics Christian at all? 
since they do not believe in the Trinity of the Orthodox. Now, that's a good question. Thank you, Orthodox Unlimited. Um, so we have terms that we use in a precise dogmatic way, and that's what the whole debate was around Crete, that we have a council, and in the council conciliar text, the words have to be used in a precise dogmatic way. So they talked about church, and they put the term heterodox before it, and strictly speaking, there is no such thing as a heterodox church because the church is the body of Christ. We can't talk about the body of Christ being heretical. So that's why people were saying this text is not orthodox. And there were people responding. I remember a prominent nun from Vienna was responding and saying, this is nonsense. We use the term all the time. Uh, we, we use the term. We talk about the, the Protestant church down the street, the Baptist church. Of course we do. But we're not talking about orthodox dogmatic theology. We're not in a council of the orthodox bishops. We're not issuing a dogmatic text. So obviously, this is a totally different context. You can speak about, and we do speak about, churches and Christians all the time without that being a necessarily a used in a dogmatic sense. Now, the problem, of course, here, so you've seen the distinction here. Dogmatically, strictly speaking, there are no other churches and there are no Christians outside the church. Of course not. It's not We don't believe in Christianity. We believe in the church, the body of Christ, Christ. Church, body of Christ, Christ, one thing, inseparable. So we don't believe in Christianity. Christ didn't come to found a religion called Christianity. There's no such thing for us called Christianity in terms of ecclesiology. But in terms of a phenomenon, a sociological phenomenon, an historical phenomenon, there is such thing as Christianity. And it's a religion that people talk about. It's not the church. It's not the experience of the church. We can make those distinctions. We have to make those distinctions. The problem arises when we do this, either it, we talk about the church either sloppily, lazily, and we give the impression that we don't have a dogmatic conscience and we're not speaking dogmatically about the church. And so we confuse people and we go along with it because it's, it's easier, right? We're not interested in confessing the faith to our, our fellows. Uh, the problem is when, 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 when we do that and, and we present it in, a, in an orthodox way we, as if this is the orthodox teaching, right? Or we mislead, mislead people. So I think the, the, the answer is not to say you can't call anybody outside the orthodox church a Christian, although strictly speaking, there are no Christians outside the church. Uh, the answer is not to say cease speaking of Christians uh, because I, but to define our terms always and to be very clear with everyone we talk to what we mean. And so I would say, I would say um, that we can talk about Christians and say, well, what we mean by Christians outside the church is those who follow Christ, those who try to embrace Christ and live according to his commandments, but have not put on Christ because that only happens in the church. That happens in baptism and they become members of his body only in the mysteries in the church. So, that needs to happen. You actually need to, to spell that out to people at some point so that people don't think you are a relativist in terms of the body of Christ and of the person of Christ. So that distinction is important. I appreciate the question. I hopefully I've answered how we deal with that. I think that's the best way to deal with that. Uh, we don't want to be misunderstood. We don't want people to think that we believe the church uh, is heterodox, orthodox altogether, and it's all just one big happy family. That would be not profitable for anyone if we gave that impression. All right, another question. Is it correct to simply state that the filioque is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? Well, St. Gregory, St. Mark, indeed say such, such a thing. So it would not be incorrect to say it is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Uh, now, having said that, strictly speaking, uh, it is true. On the other hand, when we say it, usually we mean that the motivation, the stance of those who are blaspheming the Holy Spirit. It has, it, it's, in the scriptures, the context is clearly a cynical, pharisaical uh, 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 approach and, and, and consideration of Christ and the Holy Spirit, right? So that we cannot ignore the motivation. And, and it seems to imply that those who are blaspheming the Holy Spirit are doing so intent, with intention. A vast majority of people who, who confess the filioque have no idea 
And certainly, I think, do not intend to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. So I think we have to make that distinction. Again, we have to make the distinction in the context. Look at the context. Strictly speaking, theologically, theoretically, it, it is a blasphemy of the Holy Spirit because it 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 creates two two sources, two two uh, causes. It de denigrates the Holy Spirit to something less than the other two. I mean, it's obvious the theology cannot stand, and so it is heretical and it is a blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. But it doesn't mean that everyone saying it is intentionally blaspheming the Holy Spirit or are blasphemers of the Holy Spirit will be considered as such. There are just so so much ignorance that I don't think we can we can impugn we can we can claim we can hold people to that. Now, if we teach the teach the people and they insist that this is not blasphemy, then we then we have we have a strong delusion and we have somebody who's borderline uh, you know, speaking against the Holy Spirit. But it, it, the vast majority of the time, people are clueless. They have no idea the implications of what they're saying. So I would be reticent to say they're all blasphemers. That would not be very wise or discerning. What is the best scriptural reference that proves the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father? Well, of course, in John, he's, the Lord himself says, the, the Spirit that proceeds from the Father. So the, it's, it's in, in uh, I don't remember the exact passage. If anybody has it, they can post it here. But John, I don't know, was it 20 something? I don't remember. But it's very clear he doesn't, he says, the Lord himself says, the spirit which proceeds from the Father. That's where we get the, the that's why we confess what we confess, because the Lord himself says it. Uh, there's no scriptural basis uh, for saying that, that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son, when we're talking about procession, of course, we're talking about eternal procession. We're talking about we're not talking about Christ sending the Holy Spirit. He says elsewhere, "I will send the Holy Spirit," but sending the Holy Spirit has to do with the mission, the temporal, the economy, not the theology of the Holy Trinity. The economy, two different things, right? We're talking about the economy of salvation, yes, Christ sends the Holy Spirit. We're talking about the procession and the relationship of the Holy Trinity, which is what we confess in the creed. We're not talking about the economy at that context. In that context, we're talking about the the theology of the Holy Trinity, that's talking about the relationship of the Holy Trinity, and, the, and that's only procession. So that is the scriptural passage that you want there. Um, are those who are only chrismated full members of the church, Athenites will baptize such people. Are Athenites simply correcting the form of reception, or are such people actually not in the church? Well, that's a good question uh, in the sense that I mean, I don't have any patristic or contemporary saint to quote or to guide to guide us on this. So you're asking me, and I'll give you what I understand, what I've gleaned from my discussions, my time on Athos, and my time examining this 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 question for the last almost 30 years now. And since the time I became Orthodox, I've been examining the question of ecclesiology and baptism and all the rest. And I would say, from my experience and my judgment, and of course I could be wrong. Uh, I, I'm, I'm wrong I'm, uh, when I'm relying on my own rational intellect. I can be definitely wrong. So this is just a speculation. I don't have, a, again, a saint or a church father to point you to, or even an Athenite elder who's told me unequivocally, what. how do we understand this? But here's my understanding from my experience with other people who've been baptized, uh, uh, either directly or after chrismation, uh, after talking to them. And that is that one does become a member of, of the church becomes a participant in the life of the church through chrismation and communion. I can't doubt that. Uh, there is an, a change. There is an event, uh, and that's witnessed to in the people in the lives of those people who. But it is not the event that they, when they're baptized later, it's a totally more full, intense, and and a different experience. And it, it's that it's that at that time that they say. I now feel that I am totally immersed and a, a member of the body. Now, how do you explain that? How do you unpack that? Consistent with our theology, it's hard to do. I don't know. I'm not there yet. But that's my understanding, that there's, a, there's, there's definitely something lacking. That's what, that's what I've been told by elders, holy elders, saints. Uh, I think the, the elder that told me that will be declared a saint in the future. And and so there is there is something missing, and that's why the fathers and Athos, without hesitation, baptize those who've been chrismated. 
because they, they, they do believe there's something missing. Now, there will be a lot of people in the church who will take issue with what I just said, who will be very angry with me, who might even consider me to be in delusion. I don't know. But that, that only underscores the importance of the matter and why the church has to deal with it and why we have to take seriously the witness of the saints and the Athenites. It only underscores the fact that we are increasingly building uh, uh, in, the, in the diaspora, the so-called diaspora, in the, in the missionary countries around the world. We're building churches, spiritually speaking, on a foundation which is very, which is very questionable and has been questioned by saints of our day. So, uh, so I guess going forward, I would hope the church in council, the, the saints of the church, the holy elders of the church, the holy bishops of the church, would take this up in earnest and 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 give us a, a clear answer as to what is going on here when when it's de, when it's determined and declared by the saints of the church that reception by in this context is not blessed is not fruit bearing what is the reality and what what are the consequences of what should, what should people do it's not an easy answer to give and I don't I don't claim I'm uh, you know the the spokesman of the church that I can give you the answer definitively. Um, they're definitely correcting an error. That's there's no doubt about that. They are correcting the form of deception. Uh, but uh, what it means practically for that spiritually, only one who has experience can, can give that a definitive answer. I would point you to a video online of one who had an experience, explains it. I think it's representative of other people's experiences, and they can give you an answer. If you plug in uh, Journey to Life, Seraphim Larson, Journey to Life, Seraphim Larson, uh, you'll see his witness to his reception by Chrismation, then his baptism in, in Romania, and what he experienced. And I think that that is representative of many people who've gone through that same process. All right. Um, are those who are only chrismated full members of the church? Uh, no, we just did that. Father Bess, what would you respond to a Catholic who claims that the fact that the RCC performs exorcism is proof of valid sacraments, especially valid baptism? Well, I don't understand the claim that you perform exorcisms. Is is is, is that is that somehow proven that they're ex, they're exorcising the demons? Why? Why is that? Why should we believe that they're exercising the demons? What is? That's not just the just the performance, just the saying of the words and carrying out the exorcism does not prove anything. Uh, and and the question is, what is what spiritually is happening there? That's a, a you know a big question, and I don't think uh, you know, I have never examined it. I don't know of any Orthodox who sat down and said, let's examine whether Roman Catholics are really performing exorcisms or not. Uh, Whatever is happening spiritually there, there's a variety of things that could be going on. Um, you know, the demons are very tricky and very deceptive. And so uh, there's no proof in that context of anything in terms of the mysteries. I don't see how you can somehow prove anything just because they're performing and carrying out the, the exorcism. And claiming that well they've 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 chased the, extra, the demons out, uh, no, that's not a. I don't know of any church father or any saint who's ever said let's examine that maybe maybe that way we can see if there's really a spiritual reality going on there. That's not how that works. That's not how we approach those issues. Um, if I'm not baptized Orthodox, are my prayers heard? Of course, your prayers are heard. Everybody's prayers are heard. God hears every prayer, even of. The, the pagan who's praying, God, show me the way. Uh, I am praying. Now, are they heard in the sense that they're consistent with God's will for me? That's a whole different issue, right? But people, God is hearing you, your prayers. Now, are they listened to and replied to? It depends on whether it's for the salvation. You're praying for something that's for your salvation, right? God's only going to answer anyone's prayer, whether they're Orthodox or not, if it's salvific so if i pray uh, i don't know to become a, uh, let's say i'm i'm in the angle community and i say god i really want to become a priest in the angle community I, that 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 is, is that salvific for me i mean only the providence of god and what he know what he's he alone is working with each person and where they're at and how to bring them step by step to the light 
So uh, it's it's uh, it depends on whether something is salvific, whether it's going to be heard in the sense of answered and and brought about, but whether God is listening and hearing and and drawing near to you when you pray, he certainly is. He's hearing everyone. Uh, but as the same uh, Fotikis, uh, the other close of Fotikis says, before baptism, the unclean demons dwell within and the Holy Spirit dwells without. And after baptism, the opposite. The demons are expelled and the Holy Spirit dwells within. So the demarcation in the line of baptism, according to the patristic teaching, is very clear. Changes the whole changes the whole relationship of the person to God in terms of prayer. Now we have the Holy Spirit saying "Abba, Father," right? Now we have the Holy Spirit crying out from within after baptism. That's a different kind of prayer and praying relationship with God. Uh, so definitely keep praying, keep praying fervently the Jesus Prayer, complying all the services as an inquirer, as an catechumen, even as somebody who's just interested in orthodoxy. Always prayer is going to be uh, blessed and going to be um, uh, beneficial on the path to salvation. Uh, let's see. We have some more questions here. Did I answer them all? John, if I didn't answer, if I'm missing one, you know, repost it below. I'm going to go down to the bottom now. Uh Forgive me if this is not the place to ask this, but I'm deeply troubled as the priest I am being received into the church under has expressed that I will be received by confession of faith. I'm converted from Roman Catholicism. How should I approach this with him? Uh, okay, well, thank you uh, for your question. Unfortunately, uh, that there is some local churches, or one local church to my knowledge, that practices confession of faith. And there are some clerics who are heavily influenced by a sacramentology and ecclesiology of the Latins who think that this is consistent with Patricia teaching. And the, the, the short answer is it's an error. It's erroneous. It's not witnessed to by any of the Holy Fathers. It's a practice that was introduced, I think, mainly in Russia but it is not witnessed to by the saints of the church. And it's certainly not the, the, the practice uh, that you can find in any of the ancient canons. Uh, so I, I, I think that you have every basis to say, uh, I, will, I will not, I cannot be received by confession of faith. And if he insists, then you should depart and go find another priest. That's what I would tell you. Now, I will be probably hated by certain priests for what I just said. But it's a matter of truth, and it's a matter of truth that we have to stand and confess. And if they want to, you know, tell me that uh, I'm undermining the obedience to a priest, I would say be obedient to the Holy Fathers, and then they will be obedient to you. That's not a patristic stance. The Holy Fathers have taught, the whole ecumenical, ecumenical patriarchate has ruled in 1755. The Holy Fathers, fathers have taught the same See, Mark, Mark, even in his day, obviously never said confession of faith. He said chrismation. So even in his day, when they, before Trent, before all of the, 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 the developments that we have after uh, the fall of Constantinople and all the rest, uh, you have chrismation. You don't have confession of faith. So where, on what basis could you possibly have confession of faith as a way to enter the Orthodox Church? Impossible. Unless you've adopted an ecumenistic ecclesiology, which is heretical. Any ecclesiology deposits that they're already in the church, they're already baptized, they're already communing, they're already chrismated, is heretical. I cannot stress this enough. That is not an ecclesiology that the Orthodox Church has ever had. It does not teach that. It does not teach it in its saints. It does not teach it in its conciliar text. That is her heretical. It's her her heresy to teach that the church is divided. It's heretical to teach that the baptism exists outside. Any mystery exists outside the body of Christ and the confession of the Orthodox faith. Uh, the only way you can explain our pastoral teaching on an Orthodox ecclesiological basis is the economia acrivia uh, uh, interpretive key, as we've said again and again. So going back to your question, 
Absolutely not. You cannot be received by confession of faith. In fact, if you follow the Holy Fathers, you should be received by baptism, and you should find a priest who will follow the Holy Fathers and baptize you. You will never regret baptism. Many people have regretted being received by chrismation or by confession of faith. To, it's very tragic for the conscience to be bothered after having come into the church and to say, I, I'm missing something. There are many souls out there who are saying, I'm missing something. Again, there are going to be priests and bishops who are not going to like what I just said. So be it. God, let's have the discussion. Let's have the debate. Let's, let's talk about this Is it long enough that we're ignoring the patristic witness on these questions. We needed to deal with them. And I'm, I'm happy to be a, a, a punching bag if it means that in the end, we're going to deal with these issues and people are going to be taught the faith of the Holy Fathers. How do we understand someone like St. Elizabeth? She reached sainthood, but she was received but for via chrismation. That's right, Justin. We have Father Seraphim Rose, who was also chrismated. And I think he's a saint. So what do we say about that? Well, here's what we don't do. We don't do ecclesiology on the basis of the exception or on the basis of circumstances or on the basis, basis of, of one or two experiences of one or two saints. That's not how we do ecclesiology. So whatever we're going to say about what happened to St. Elizabeth or Father Seraphim Rose, it cannot therefore change our ecclesiology, right? We start with ecclesiology, we start with the Christology, with ecclesiology, and then we understand the pastoral practice of the church, economia, in that context. I cannot stress that enough. If you don't follow that process, Christology, Trinitarian theology, Christology, ecclesiology, and then the pastoral management of the household, economia, in that order, you will not make sense of what the church has done. And, of course, we always have to say that, as Father John Rubini, Father John Meindorf says in Visiting Theology, I, I was going to post it tonight, um, but I did not. I didn't bring the book with me, unfortunately. But I'll, I'll bring it next time. Very wise and wonderful, wonderfully put uh, in his section on ecclesiology. At the end, he talks about economy. And I really recommend if you have the book, Byzantine Theology, Father John Meindorf, look in there and, and think about it, reflect on what he says about economy in there. And one thing he does say in this context here that makes sense, he says, look, it's been abused. And it can be abused. And that's the thing about economy. It can be abused. And, and because it's up to the freedom of the bishop and priest to rightly divide, rightly apply, and, and, and that freedom can never be taken away. We can't become legalists. So there will be errors. There will be abuses. There'll be abuses also for political reasons. And the reality is that I think the, pro, the, the, the stance taken by the Russian church to chrismate or received by vesting or received by confession of faith ultimately comes back to a time period which not only were they westernized, Latinized in their theology in terms of ecclesiology, and they were, they were taking wholesale ideas from the West, but they were politically driven. So the decisions, a lot of them were politically driven. And now that all ceases at, 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 in 1918. And the church is now in the wilderness. The church is in the diaspora. The church is in, in the times of the, before the Antichrist. And obviously those considerations or those impositions should no longer be followed in our day. And, and that's why, that's why St. Hilarion Trotsky's masterful a review of this question in his un on the unity of the church, which you can find online, and I've recommended, I've quoted from twice in this, this course, it's really important to read and understand what he was trying to do was say exactly what I, what I just said. He's trying to recover the patristic stance in the midst of all these different historical abuses or historical developments. People oftentimes go to history and say, oh, look, the church did this in this time. Therefore, it's very wrong. Historians are not theologians. Historians tell us what happened in history doesn't mean that's the expression of the mind and the, and the, of the saints and the mind of Christ. So historical precedent, historical event, events may or may not reflect our ecclesiology. We don't start with historical events and say, this is what we believe. We don't start with an exception like St. Elizabeth or Father Seraphim and say, therefore, we should always chrismate. And here's my interpretation. And this is my interpretation. I might be wrong. But here's my interpretation. How do I make sense of, in the context of Orthodox ecclesiology, how do I make sense of the reception of Father Seraphim and St. Elizabeth and, they, and their glorification in God through ascetic struggle and dying every day or through martyrdom. And that is that in spite of the error, because of the great love, in spite of the error or in spite of the 
the, the departure from Akrivia, which was unjustified, but because of the ignorance and also because mainly of the love that God, in spite of that, in spite of what should have happened, worked and, and glorified these, uh, these ascetics, these, these saints of our church. So, again, it doesn't make the rule. Uh, and I don't think we can do theology from uh, examples of saints being received properly or improperly or whatever it might be. We don't start there. Okay, so that's my answer there. Uh, I don't know if it's satisfactory, but that's how I would answer that. And I would say Father Seraphim is a saint, in spite of him being received by chrismation, which I think would would have been it would have been better, uh, would have been more faithful to the holy tradition had he had he been baptized. Certainly, as as a Methodist, uh, I mean, there's just no. If you look at Canon 95, you look at the St. Basil, you look at the way that fathers understood all these various uh, heretics in their reception, there's no basis today at all, zero, to receive any, any of the Protestants or Roman Catholics by chrismation, especially the Protestants, especially the Protestants, who are even further away, who don't even have recognized mysteries, who don't even recognize priesthood. I mean, it would be un unfathomable for the first millennium saints to 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 to, uh, to talk about these kind of groups being received by economia, so I cannot say well. Therefore, it's okay. It's not. In spite of it, God God worked uh, a great miracle in their lives, and and they were glorified. All right, uh, we I think have as far as I can see, I've answered all the questions. I hope I didn't miss any, and we have reached. Two hours and 21 minutes. So we're going to call it a night. We're going to stop here. Uh, and we appreciate your participation and your dedication to the theology of the Holy Fathers, the teachings of the Holy Fathers, your love for the saints. Hopefully this lecture has only increased that. It's increased your love of St. Mark, St. Gregory, St. Photios. Go out and buy an icon of the three hierarchs, the three uh, pillars of orthodoxy. Read the lives. Buy the book. Uh, the three pillars of orthodoxy from the monastery in, uh, uh, in in Colorado. Read the writings of the saints. Buy the 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 the, the writings of Saint Gregory that we're going to produce. It's all going to be extremely beneficial for all of us as a church, but each one of us individually. We need their intercessions today. We need their love for the church, uh, and we need to imitate them. So hopefully, this lecture has helped you in that. The answers I've given have helped. Uh, Pray for me, because my goal here is to walk the narrow royal path and to lead you behind the saints, to, to, to put you on that path which follow after the saints. That's my goal. And to get out of the way and let the saints speak and to get out of the way and not put my interpretation. If I've said anything here that is uh, erroneous, uh, God help me and uh, God forgive me and pray for my illumination that I might only speak what uh, the Holy Spirit gives and is witness to in the lives of the saints. So let's uh, let's chant our Tripari to the to the Holy Cross and until next Tuesday. Now, for those of us, those of you on in Patreon, uh, we will have our session um, as uh, not as usual because we have the on the new calendar. We have the feast of the twenty fifth of of March on Thursday. So most people are going to have vigil on. Uh, uh, no, I'm sorry. Normally, Thursday night, as as usual, Thursday night as usual, we'll have our question and answer. So that'll be 9 p.m. on Thursday night. All right? All right. God bless. We'll see you then. <coughs>